There are three books in the Bible that have come to be called the wisdom literature, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. And all of these books are addressing the same set of questions. What kind of world are we living in? And what does it look like to live well in this world? So how to be good at life. Yeah. So each of these books tackles these questions from a unique perspective, and it's important to understand all of them to get a fully biblical perspective on the good life. So as a thought experiment, you could actually imagine each of these books as a person. So Proverbs would be like this brilliant young teacher, and Ecclesiastes is the sharp middle-aged critic, and Job would be this weathered old man who's seen a lot in his day. We're going to start by meeting the book of Proverbs, the brilliant young teacher. And she's not just smart, she's smart about everything, work, relationships, sex, spirituality. She has incredible insights things you wouldn't see on your own. Yeah, she would be the perfect friend to have around when you need really specific advice. So what makes her so smart? Well, Proverbs can see things that most people don't see. She believes that there's an invisible creative force in the universe that can guide people in how they should live. And you can't see it, just like you can't see gravity, but it affects everything that we do. So what's this force? Well, in Hebrew, it's called chokhmah, and it usually gets translated into English as wisdom. It's an attribute of God that God used to create the world. And chokmah has been woven into the fabric of things and how they work. So wherever people are making good or just or wise decisions, they're tapping into chokmah. And whenever someone's making a bad decision, they're working against chokmah. Right, or as it says in Proverbs chapter 1, the waywardness of fools will destroy them, but the one who listens to wisdom lives in security. So it's like a moral law of the universe. Yeah, it's a cause-effect pattern, and no one can escape it. And Proverbs personifies all of this as a woman. Yeah, Lady Wisdom. Right, and she roams around the earth calling out, making herself available to anyone who's willing to listen to her and to learn. Which leads to the second thing Proverbs believes, that anyone can access and interact with wisdom and use it to make a beautiful life for yourself or for others. You can create with it like a designer. Yes, in fact, chokmah in Hebrew isn't simply intellectual knowledge. The word is also used to describe a skilled artisan who excels at their craft, like woodworking or stonemasonry. So you show you possess chokmah when you put it to work and develop the skill of making a good life. Okay, that makes sense. So let's do this. Let's go find some wisdom. But before you do, Proverbs has one more really important thing to consider. Chokmah isn't some impersonal force. It's an attribute of God himself. And so in Hebrew thought, your journey to becoming wise has to begin with what Proverbs calls the fear of the Lord. It's this healthy respect for God's definition of good and evil. And true wisdom means learning those boundary lines and not crossing them. Now, all those ideas you just unpacked are in chapters 1 through 9 in Proverbs. But when I think of the book of Proverbs, I think of the collection of sayings, the Proverbs themselves. Tell me about those. Yeah, those are what you find in chapters 10 on to the end of the book. It's a collection of hundreds and hundreds of Proverbs about any and all aspects of life. And chokmah gets applied to them, resulting in this wise guidance to help you find a path towards success and no matter what you do. If I design my life with these sayings, life is going to be good. Yeah, or as Proverbs puts it, it'll give health to your bones, prosperity, a long, rich life. Which is a really big claim. But you can see how it's often the case. Wise people, they tend to do better. Things usually work out well for them in life. And so that is the promise and the wisdom of the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is really beautiful. But if we take a step back, some people would argue it's a little too simplistic. Because sometimes horrible things happen to really wise people, and sometimes oh. foolish people get rewarded. It doesn't always work the way we think it should work. That's right. Which is why we need to go and listen to our next wise friend, Ecclesiastes the Critic. Because he's wrestled with that very problem, and he's going to push us further in our journey to find the good life. Well, friends, this morning, uh, this is normally the time in the service when you hear the word of God read, and then it's proclaimed. But this morning we're gonna do things a little bit out of order, we're just shaking it up a little bit, and the scripture passage is going to be folded into the message. So, without further ado, will you pray with me? (sighs) 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I acknowledge in this moment that I am a broken and imperfect vessel. But God, what a gift it is to know brokenness. What a gift it is to know your healing power. God, I ask this morning um, that you would unveil our eyes to your truth, your wisdom, your ma for us this day. That as we encounter your word, that we might be cognizant of the fact that you are here with us, that you are speaking to us, and that as broken as we might feel, you are working all things together for good. And so, God, I ask in this moment that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon all of us gathered here, that we might receive clarity of mind, heart, and spirit, that we might hear you, experience you anew this day. And I ask, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. So my hope this morning is that today's message would be the least preachy sermon you've ever heard. Like, I don't want you to feel preached at. That's my hope. I hope that this just feels like a conversation between two friends. With that being said, this week we are in the fourth installment of a sermon series called what? Uncommon sense. Yeah, that's right, because this is a conversation between two friends. That means you have to respond, right? All right, so today we are in a sermon series called? Yeah, we are. And in week one, we discovered an uncommon sense truth. The uncommon sense of the Bible tells us that wisdom, oh, ma, is not the ascent of the mind, but it is the humbling of the heart. It is our willingness to adopt a servant's heart in everything that we do. To submit to the idea that maybe we don't know everything and we really can't. That some things we need to just trust and set our pride aside knowing that God is God and praise God, we are not. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Second week, we discovered that we have this propensity within us, don't we? That we work so hard to tell ourselves that God couldn't possibly love us. Like, yes, Jesus died for the sake of the world, but that's the world, not me. We work so hard to convince ourselves that God couldn't possibly love us, and all the while, God will stop at nothing to convince us otherwise. Nothing. And he proved it, didn't he, on Calvary. Last week, we discovered the deepest truth, the one that really gets at the root of that last question of who we are and whose we are and the value, the intrinsic worth that we possess. Last week, we discovered that no one, no one is disqualified from the love and grace of God. And so we need to stop acting like it. We need to acknowledge the people that we treat as others in our lives And we need to recognize that they too are a child of God. Last week, Sean Gladding like really deeply convicted us, at least me, of this truth that even today, even in the church, we can easily find ourselves to be polarized on every topic and any topic that we live in this reality of us versus them and how often do we sit in judgment of those people? How often do we look upon others with contempt? We feel for good reason. 
we, as we proclaim today in that baptismal covenant, are ministers of reconciliation. Each and every one of us who claims the lordship of Jesus Christ is called to be a minister of this gospel, to be peacemakers, to be bridge builders, not perpetuators of strife, sin, and condemnation. That is not our call. In fact, there is a commandment, the greatest commandment, if I recall. Does anybody know what the greatest commandment is? Oh, hey, hey, hey. Love what? Love God and love your neighbor. This is the greatest commandment. Jesus said so himself, right? Is this a thing we know? Yeah, okay, great, fantastic. So what I love most about the fact that we are journeying through the whole Bible in one year is that we're not just piecemealing the Bible like so often we do. We kind of treat it as like a Ouija board and we open it up and we hope that maybe our hand just like lands on the truth that God wants to speak to us this day, right? But really the Bible is telling a cohesive story, a meta narrative, if you will. And so often when we treat the Bible like a Ouija board, if we treat it like uh, something that it is truly not, we come to believe this lie that the God of the Old Testament certainly can't be the God of the New Testament. It can't be that the one who plagued nations also says all are loved and welcome. Or is that really what it's saying? Some of us have been convinced that like God was angry until Jesus showed up and told him what was going on, right? Like that's not the truth. The truth is that Jesus and eventually his disciples just brought the commandments to life in a way that non-Jewish people could begin to grapple with. This morning, I wanna commend to you that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are the very same. And that that God doesn't change. God is good. And he works all things together for the good of all, not just a few. So let's sit with that truth for a moment. And let's stand for the reading of God's word. Today's scripture passage comes from the book of Proverbs, coincidentally, chapter 25, verses 21 and 22. You'll notice it's quite short. Okay, it reads, if your enemies are starving, feed them some bread. If they are thirsty, give them water to drink. By doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads, and the Lord will remove Will reward me? Hold on, this can't be right. Can we try that again? Will you read this with me? Let's go back to that first slide. Let's say this together. If your enemies are starving, feed them some bread. If they are thirsty, give them water to drink. By doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads and the Lord will reward you. Okay, so this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God, you may be seated. But this just can't be right, right? Can we just sit with this for a moment? This cannot be right. If the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are the same, and if God has called us to love God and love neighbor, then why on earth would he call for our retribution? Why on earth would he call us to heap burning coals on our enemy's head? Well, let's go to the New Testament, right? Like that's where the real stuff happens, we believe. And so let's go to Romans chapter 12, verses 16 through 21, because Paul says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, 
Never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This can't be right, right? This can't be what he's saying. Why is it that it... Okay, let's go to another passage. Maybe Jesus himself can bring to light what's happening here. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, you have heard it said, you must love your neighbor. And hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who hate you, those who harass you, so that you will be acting as children of your Father who is in heaven. He makes the sun rise on both the evil and the good. He makes the sun rise on both the evil and the good and sends rain on both the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love only those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing? Don't even the Gentiles do the same. Therefore, just as your heavenly Father is complete in showing love to everyone, so also you must be complete. I want to commend to you that there's something deeper going on in this passage than we could have guessed at first glance. Because all the context clues are pointing to the fact that we are called to love everybody, and in fact, especially our enemies, right? Is that what you heard? Because that's what I heard. So what on earth does he mean, does wisdom mean, by heap burning coals on their heads? Well, I'm about to blow your mind, y'all, because it's going to get real. So what I love about wisdom is that I don't have it, right? Other people do. So I get to go to them and find out the truth of things and then, like, claim it and tell you about it. So that's what I did. I went to a commentary about this particular passage because it shook me. There's no way. There's no way that I'm supposed to seek retribution. So what I discovered is that there's this cultural expectation in tribal societies, like the one of ancient Mesopotamia, of Israel. You can imagine that this is a society in which everything depends upon fire, right? In order to eat, you need fire. In order to have clean water, you need fire. And so imagine then if the whole of your livelihood depended upon some coals that had life in them. So then if you were to, say, uh, watch your fire burn out, you might then go to a neighbor and say to them, I have nothing left. Will you give me coals so that I might continue to survive? so that I might continue to provide for my family. And that neighbor would most certainly give you a pan full of live coals, burning coals, coals that would enable you to then go home and provide for your family. And in that tribal culture, you would have to most likely walk quite a distance. And so you would then put that pan, that heap on your head, and you would walk home. Now, this is absolutely expected of a neighbor. This is absolutely expected in a tribal culture, but in no way was this ever expected to be extended to my enemy, to my oppressor, to the one who hates me and who brings out the worst in me. Ma, wisdom. If living under the influence of wisdom is coming in contact with the very essence of God, then this is our call. 
This is our call to do all that we can to create space to encounter that wisdom, to be conduits of live coals, to be the ones who extend love and grace and forgiveness to all, no matter their tribe, their tongue, their nation, no matter how much we might dislike how they make us feel or what they bring out in us. We are called to heap burning coals on their heads with all love and humility. Now, one of the things that I just think is not a coincidence is this theme, this motif that is woven throughout the Old Testament of coals. I think one, it talks to, um, it speaks to the essential need of fire, right? But I also think about that vision from the prophet Ezekiel when this seraphim comes to him. We watched this embodied in the holiness video from the Bible Project. And the seraphim, this super scary winged creature, this angel of the Lord that is terrifying to behold, comes to Ezekiel in this dream and touches his lips with what? A burning coal. And in that moment, he's not consumed. In that moment, he's not devoured or displeased, but is in fact transformed. He encounters the very holy presence of God and becomes a new creation. Friends, I think that there's something there for us. I think that when God gives us the opportunity to love an enemy, there's a burning coal in our hands that God longs to use in the most powerful of ways for transformation. Now, this call to love our enemies, you might be sitting here thinking, okay, Ashley, that's a really nice thing to say. Like, yes, Jesus said it, but he didn't really mean it, right? I mean, this is an incredibly difficult truth to live out. How am I supposed to love someone who really I kind of wish didn't exist. Well, with all humility and love, friends, I want to tell you that it's possible. And I want to tell you that it is the call on your life. It is the call on your life. Now, the most perfect example that I've encountered of this particular concept of forgiving the unforgivable, of extending heaping coals on the heads of enemies, is actually uh, paid witness to in the life of Corey Ten Boom. How many of you in this room have ever heard of the name Corey Ten Boom or know who she is? Can you raise a hand? I'm just curious. Okay, for those of you who don't know, uh, Corrie ten Boom, well, she was the daughter of a, an infinite, infamous watchmaker. And in the time of Nazi Germany, uh, the Ten Booms were actually offering safe haven. They were offering a hiding place to Jews. And one day, uh, an informant let Nazi soldiers know what the Ten Booms were up to, and they came and they arrested the Ten Boom family. But all of the Jews being hidden remained safe. And they, uh, the Ten Booms, were carted off to concentration camps. And of course, separated from one another, and two days into concentration camping, uh, the father was murdered. The mother was murdered, and after a few weeks, uh, Corey and her sister, Betsy, who her book says she loved more than anyone, you can tell by the way she writes about her sister, Betsy, that this was a deep, intimate, loving friendship between two sisters. And what ends up happening is that uh, one day, to no fault of her own, Betsy provokes the anger the unrighteous anger of a Nazi soldier. And in front of Corey, he beats Betsy to death and then turns to her and says, you're next. Well, just a few weeks later, by a clerical error, Corey gets released from the concentration camp. And two days later, her cabin of women were sent to the gas chamber. 
Now, several years later, Corey actually had the opportunity to go and meet that Nazi soldier. And after all these years, the uncommon sense of this world would say that she ought to probably like spit in his face or call for his execution, call for justice to be done in his life. But the gospel of Jesus told her something else. No, when she had the opportunity to encounter that man who broke her in ways that she could have never asked for, she extended forgiveness. She showed him love. And in that moment, he encountered the unconditional love of Jesus, something he didn't deserve, but frankly, none of us do. None of us do. But y'all, compassion, not revenge, should characterize the life of every believer just as it did Corey. And acceptance and forgiveness don't come easily to us, right? Like, I don't think this is like a Christian issue. I don't think it's a Mankato thing. Like, it's, it's a human issue. We struggle to accept others as they are, to forgive them when they sin against us. No, our natural instinct is to recoil, right? Like, fight or flight. Like David and I described that one day we depicted for you, you want to smack them and run away, right? Like, that's what we want to do. Our natural instinct is to push back from those who don't fit into our nice, neat little box, who don't live as we would like for them to live, who don't treat us the way we long to be treated, who don't embody the ideals that we espouse to be true and right. We don't naturally overflow with mercy, grace, and patience. But that's where Jesus comes in. And in the words of my friend Kathy, loving others just as they are is often the gift that helps them to heal and accept Christ. Loving others just as they are, not as we long for them to be, not as we hope for them to be, but just as they are is often the gift that helps them heal and transform and become more and more like Jesus every day. It's not by condemning them or ostracizing them, dehumanizing them or demonizing them. It is loving it is seeing the very image of God in the eyes and soul of another human being and honoring that because Jesus honors it in each and every one of you. We are called to reach out to those who are hungry and offer them something to eat. We are called to reach out to those who are thirsty and offer them something to drink. We are called to heap burning coals on the heads of our enemies. This is the call on each and every one of our lives. This week, every single time that I turned on the news, I was just overwhelmed. Overwhelmed by anything and everything that this world had to offer through the media. And I don't care who your provider is, I don't care which network you watch, each and every last bit of it is horrific. Each and every bit of what this world is demonstrating for us is heartbreaking. And it is not who we are called to be. This is not how we are called to live. And this week, more than anything, my heart has been broken in realizing that there are people in the public eye, just as there are people in each and every one of our lives who suffer in silence, who have been longing 
for somebody to see them hungry and feed them. Who have been thirsty beyond belief and just longing for somebody to give them something to drink. There are people who have suffered in silence for so long that they have chosen to take their own lives. And there are people in each and every one of our lives, there are people in this room who are walking that same road. Who are terrified that they have been disqualified. There are people in this room who sit suffering in silence and are longing for someone to see them in this season and to reach out to them and to remind them how loved they are, that they are not alone. We are called to see them, to minister to them, to love them unconditionally, and then to heap burning coals on their heads. If that is you, I want you to know how deeply you are loved, how truly you are welcome in the family of God, and how unalone you really are. Today, if no other day, there is a chance for us to acknowledge in the fullness of God's grace that we too demonize people, that we too forget people, that we too are called to see the image of God in every person and to honor it unconditionally and without reservation, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Y'all, the greatest story ever told is a true one. That the God who created the universe, the God cre who created humanity to be an intimate, constant relationship with himself, died a death he didn't deserve, rose again so that we might be freed from the shackles of sin and death, so that we might not be perpetuators of sin, strife, and condemnation, but that we might proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to remind them that the time has come, that love has won, and we only and ever exist to tell that story. How will we live like that today? How is God calling you to tear down that wall, to stop being a gatekeeper to the kingdom of God and to invite this whole world in? Even that person that really pisses you off. Friends, the call is clear. You are loved, and you are called to love. Will you pray with me? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I just want to create space that as your Spirit has moved in this place this day, we might be moved to bring the fullness of who we are, the fullness of our prejudices, the fullness of our inability to love perfectly to your throne. To know that there's nothing we ever did to deserve this love, and so we are called to extend it freely, to throw it around like confetti, and to bring any and everyone into that gate who you put in our path. God, remind us this day that you already know. 
you already see every shadowy corner of our soul. And you just long to light it up. That we might not be afraid of the darkness, but that we might allow your perfect love to drive it out. And so God, I open this time, this prayer rail to your children. And I invite all those who long to draw closer to you in this moment, to come and kneel, to hand over to you those things which stand in the way, which shackle us. To just come as we are and to trust that that is enough. Will you join me in prayer? this morning we give ourselves to you. We ask you to rock us. To restore us, to transform and heal us into the image of your son. Not as a photocopy God, but as the perfect reflection that only each and every one of us can be. Uniquely us but united in love. God, as you bring to the forefront of our minds names and faces of those whom we have hated, those whom we have vilified and demonized, Lord, that you would break down that wall, that you would let love in where we can't, where we wouldn't, and enable us to be ones who are conduits of your holy love here and now. God, your call is simple and your voice is clear. Help us to respond as only we can to be your hands and feet in this world, to heat burning coals, on the heads of every person we meet. We pray all this in Jesus' name, and we pray as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 